Mail time. Who is the most important prospect left on Notre Dame's board in the class of 2025? Plus, should we expect 11 wins from the Irish this season? It's all coming right up. You are Locked On Irish, your daily podcast on the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. What's going on? Welcome into Locked On Irish, your daily Notre Dame podcast. Today is Friday, April 5th, so happy Friday. And thank you for getting your day started right here by making this your first listen of the day. I'm your host, Tyler Wojak. I'm a Notre Dame alum and producer at Fox Sports. And you can watch this episode as well as every other episode on YouTube, or you can listen wherever you get your podcast. If you are watching along on YouTube, please like the video below and subscribe. Or if you're listening to the podcast, please take a moment to rate the show five stars, leave a review, and subscribe there as well. It's been a couple weeks, but the Friday mailbag is back, and we have a bunch of great questions. So let's get right into it. Our first one comes from at Paul underscore Bergman. Who do you think is the most important prospect left on the board in the class of 2025? Well, it would have been edge rusher Damian Shanklin, but it seems like Notre Dame is out of the running with him. I'll get to that because I got another question about Damian Shanklin. So let's say he's off the board. Um, I'm sure Notre Dame is going to continue to try and recruit him. But looking at some other realistic options that Notre Dame uh, is looking at, I think it's got to be wide receiver Derek Meadows out of Bishop Gorman in Las Vegas. Part of this is because of the position that he plays. He is a wide receiver, and Notre Dame absolutely needs more game uh, game breakers at receiver. Notre Dame also does not have a lot of receivers with his size. Derek Meadows is six foot five, two hundred, um, just two hundred pounds flat. He's also a top fifty player in the country. Notre Dame is in a really good place with him, but they still got a ways to go before they land that commitment from him. But I just think that Derek Meadows is a is a player who doesn't come around that often, at least not one who entertains Notre Dame. And Notre Dame has to land him. I think when you look at the receiver class right now, I like Burris. Um, Getting Bettis Jr. in the fold is obviously nice, but you need one guy that can really take the top off the defense and a guy who can just go up and win 50-50 balls with any defensive back that steps in his way. And that's the kind of receiver that Derek Meadows is. I think that Notre Dame is missing that, like, true game break, uh, game wrecker on offense, really. Like, they've got a couple good running back commitments, but they need an elite athlete on offense in this class. They obviously have Deuce Knight at quarterback, which is the most important position uh, in recruiting and on the field, obviously, but he needs an elite receiver to throw to, and I think Derek Meadows is absolutely that guy. So Notre Dame absolutely needs to land him if they want to have a truly elite class in 2025, but they also need commitments from guys like Dallas Golden and Mark Zachary, two defensive backs who Notre Dame is also in great shape with, but they need to land them. Dallas Golden, I just love him as a football player. He does it all for Berkeley down there in Florida. He is their primary ball carrier. He is a great defensive back, and it looks like he is going to play corner at Notre Dame now. Uh, In yesterday's episode when I had Brian Smith on, the recruiting insider for Locked On, he said that he spoke to Dallas Golden and that Dallas told him that he wants to play nickel in college. Now, that's pretty impressive because nickel is a tough position. You can't just be out there covering wide receivers. you got to get your hands dirty a little bit, get in the box, and get involved in the run game. So the fact that Dallas Golden is already ready to take on that challenge tells me all I need to know about who he is as a football player. So I would put him at second, uh, Dallas Golden, and then third, Mark Zachary, which ironically uh, might be the most likely one to commit to Notre Dame. It seems like he's been on the verge of committing to Notre Dame for a while now. He's another top 100 cornerback that Notre Dame would be thrilled to have in the fold. And I really like Mark Zachary as a player. The fact that I have him third is just because I just like Derek Meadows and Dallas Golden a little bit more. But he could be an elite cornerback. Mike Mickens has been on him early. And you got to imagine that if Notre Dame is able to land Dallas Golden and Mark Zachary, you're looking at one of the best uh, defensive back classes Notre Dame has had in a really long time. So that's all great. Notre Dame has definitely built a lot of depth in that room, uh, specifically at corner, but still, they've got a lot of ground to make up at wide receiver. And even though they've been able to transform the room uh, really this past offseason with the guys that they were able to land in last year's class and who they added in the transfer portal, I still think Notre Dame really, really needs to land Derek Meadows. Okay, next question from... Go Andy Glory. Now that Damian Shanklin is seemingly out of Notre Dame, are you concerned about the Viper position? Yeah, 
Uh, I'm concerned. So let's start with Damian Shanklin. I already kind of alluded to a little bit. Um, Tom Loy from 24-7 Sports reported on, I believe it was Thursday, that it appears that Notre Dame is no longer in the lead or they might be out of the running entirely for Damian Shanklin services. And this is a big loss. Damian Shanklin is like a top 50 recruit. He goes to Warren Central High School in Indianapolis, and Notre Dame was considered the leader for him for a long time. But he had been pretty open about the fact that Ohio State was his dream school growing up, and um, it makes sense. Indianapolis is not that far from Columbus. Ohio State has been the premier football program in the Midwest for a really long time, up until Michigan kind of took the throne from them in recent years. And as good as Notre Dame has been, they've made the playoff a couple times, they made it to the national championship. They have not had the consistent level of success that Ohio State has had uh, over the past two-plus decades. So it's not shocking that a player of Damian Shanklin's caliber would want to go to Ohio State, but man, the fact that he's so close to Notre Dame's campus and the fact that Notre Dame was involved on him early really made you think that he was going to end up with the Irish. And I'm not completely ruling it out, but it does seem like Notre Dame is lagging behind a little bit now. And yeah, I think uh, Notre Dame does not have a lot of other options at the Viper position. It is a tough blow. Right now, you've got one true edge rusher in the class and four-star Christopher Burgess out of Simeon High School. And I like Burgess. I think he could be a good player. Um, it was really important that they landed him too because he's from Chicago, another you know semi-local kid. Uh, as it pertains to Notre Dame. And I think he could be a good player, but you just need more. They also have Dominic Kulak, who's an interesting hybrid player, but he's not even ranked in the top 500 players nationally, and I'm not even sure that he's going to play Viper once he gets to Notre Dame. I mean, Hulak is 6'3", 225 pounds. Uh, that's what he's listed at now. I think he looks a little bit skinnier, so he'd probably have to add a lot of weight once he gets to college before he can actually get some serious playing time at the Viper position, and that's just not really a good place to be when you're this late in the cycle. It looks like Notre Dame is not recruiting Mark Jones, uh, a four-star anymore. Not really sure why. Maybe Mark Jones sort of moved on from Notre Dame, but Brian Smith also made it seem like Notre Dame was moving on from him. You know, on, on one hand, it's like, okay, maybe they have other options, but right now I don't really know who those options are, at least at the top, right? Like, I'm sure that Notre Dame could go and find some, like, low three-star edge rusher that would be thrilled to go to Notre Dame. But defensive end, and specifically Viper, is such an important position in the modern college game because every team is passing all the time. You have to be able to get after the quarterback without blitzing a bunch of different guys. You need to be able to get after the quarterback with three or four guys to have a truly elite defense. In order to do that, you need a truly elite Viper. And Notre Dame has really struggled at that position in uh for a long time. Now, granted, it's it's a very difficult position for Notre Dame to recruit for a bunch of different reasons. The fact that most of the best defensive ends typically come from the Southeast. That means Notre Dame has to go down there into SEC country and try to poach one of those guys. But that was not the case with Damian Shanklin. He's very close. And anytime you can get a guy who is this talented, who is this close to uh, the campus, like you got to get it done. And that's something that we talk about when we talk about like big picture recruiting problems for Notre Dame. You know, it's the same stuff that's been um, hurting Notre Dame for years, the location, the academics, all that stuff. Well, that that really wasn't in play for Damian Shanklin. And um, it looks like Notre Dame is going to have to go after some alternative options here. Um, I'm sure we're going to hear more in the coming weeks if Shanklin is really completely out of the picture. But um, I don't expect Marcus Freeman and the staff to give up on him quite yet. But right now, it is not really looking that good for the Irish. Okay, this next question, kind of a two-parter that's also related to Notre Dame recruiting. First one comes from at Drew Brennan 77. Do you think Notre Dame allowed too many guys to commit early in the 2025 class? Do you think they could have held off on a few commitments? And then the second question is um, from at McBride 7. Does Notre Dame have enough room to still land guys like Jane Blair and Dallas Golden? How big can the class be? So um, a lot of questions about Marcus Freeman's recruiting strategy. And as a matter of fact, I keep referring to yesterday's episode with Brian Smith, but Brian made the point that because Notre Dame is recruiting guys so early that other schools around the country, uh, the other top programs have basically been forced into recruiting even earlier as well. Not many schools are doing it the way that Notre Dame is doing it. And I think it's really smart and I think it's really savvy because because of the restrictions that I just mentioned when it comes to Notre Dame recruiting. So they try to alleviate that by 
getting involved with guys much earlier in the process and basically just getting a head start. Now, there are obviously risks to this because you have to be smarter with your evaluations early, and some of these guys just don't have as much tape because they're in their freshman or sophomore season, so it's a little bit harder. So it's a risk-reward thing, but it's also a big reason why Notre Dame has the number one ranked class in the country right now. But as for the questions about did they uh, take too many guys too early, no, because one, this is exactly what Marcus Freeman wants, and two, I don't think Notre Dame is going to take a commitment from guys that they really don't want. And even if a player is committed, they've moved on from guys before. Just think about defensive end Owen Wafel in the class of 2024, for example. He was committed to Notre Dame, and then Notre Dame decided they wanted to pursue other options. Um, I mean, I guess it depends on who you ask with that story, but Owen Wafel decommitted, and then he ended up in Michigan. And then you got running back Cedric Irvin from a couple classes ago as well. He was a running back committed to Notre Dame. And then Notre Dame had a couple other better options and Irvin decommitted. He ended up at Stanford. So if Notre Dame has a chance with a better prospect than maybe someone who they've been recruiting before, like they are going to take the better prospect. They're not going to get a commitment from a guy and be like, damn it, (laughs) didn't really want him. That's not the case. That's not how this works anymore, um, especially in the NIL era. So they definitely still have room for guys like uh, Blair and Golden. Blair was on campus this week. I expect Dallas Golden to get uh, back on campus uh, pretty soon as well. They're still heavily recruiting Derek Meadows, linebacker Noah McHale, and other top prospects. They have 19 commitments right now. I think when it's all said and done, Notre Dame is going to take probably 23 to 24, maybe even 25 commitments, but I doubt it. That seems like a long shot. So they at least have four to five spots. Last year, they took 23 commitments. The year before that, uh, they took 23 as well. Uh, Actually, I think it was 24, but then Brandon Hellman ended up leaving. But still, it's always going to be in that range, and Notre Dame is getting closer to that, and I think that the last few guys that Notre Dame lands in this class are all going to be guys who are at the top of the board. Hopefully, it's Derek Meadows, Dallas Golden, Mark Zachary, and maybe even Noah McHale as well. If they land all those guys, Notre Dame would have a really, really special class, even though the loss of Damian Shanklin still stings. Okay, that was a lot of recruiting uh, to start the show, but coming up next, I'm going to tell you why Notre Dame should hit the over on their season win total. Today's episode is brought to you by Robinhood. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still have an IRA? Robinhood is the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with the 3% match. That's right, no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. Claim as of quarter one, 2024, validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. A 3% match on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker dealer. All right, let's continue on with the mailbag here with a question from at Duncan 44 What do you think Vegas will project Notre Dame's win total to be this season? Well, good news for you, Duncan 44 Our friends at FanDuel already have Notre Dame's win total out. and It's at 10.5, which is actually one of the highest numbers in all of college football and one of the highest numbers it's been at Notre Dame in recent years. So the odds on the uh, over are plus 138. So if you bet $138, uh, excuse me, if you bet $100 and then Notre Dame wins 11 games this season, you will get 138 But if you want to win $100 at betting the under, you're going to have to bet $170. But right now, I like the over as we sit here today in early April with injuries to Riley Leonard and Benjamin Morrison. I still think Notre Dame can and should win 11 games the regular season, partially because I think Riley Leonard and Benjamin Morrison are both going to be healthy at the start of this season. But that should be the expectation. I think we're all in agreement here that it's college football playoff or bust this season for Notre Dame, especially with the expanded playoff and the fact that Notre Dame's schedule is more favorable than it's been in several years now. The one downside to Notre Dame's schedule this year being easy, or at least seemingly easy now, um, is that it does kind of give some credence to the idiots out there who say that, oh, Notre Dame's independent um, because they just want to play an easy schedule. That's never true, but... 
kind of is this year because who knows what to expect at the USC, Texas A&M in the first year under a new head coach. They lost a bunch of guys to the transfer portal. Louisville is going to be tricky, and there's probably going to be one team on the schedule who you don't really expect is going to be that good but ends up being better than expectations. So all that being said, Notre Dame should definitely win 11 games this season. And if I were unbiased and I was looking at this number and I didn't follow Notre Dame as closely as I do, I might think, wait a second, 10 and a half is a lot of, that's a lot of wins. And Notre Dame has not won 10 games in the regular season yet under Marcus Freeman. I might be inclined to take the under, but when you really look into the schedule and you look at the talent on Notre Dame's roster, like this team should absolutely win 11 games this season. The fact that they didn't win 10 games in the regular season last year was a massive disappointment. And I think, you know, when, when we're a few years down the road, like we already know last year's season was a disappointment. Like that's already understood. But I think as time goes by and, some of the guys from last year's team, when they go on to the NFL and they end up having really good careers as professionals, I think we're going to look back on that 2023 season and be like, how did Notre Dame only go 9-3? and three? Like, yeah, I, obviously the loss to Ohio State in the last play of the game, like, you know, crazy thing happens. Ohio State's a great program, whatever. But, like, the fact that they just got absolutely routed by Clemson and Louisville – that just does not make any sense to me. And that would be my one concern if I was betting. And again, if I was like a objective better, had no bias towards Notre Dame, and I was just kind of looking at things um, as a fan of college football over the past couple of years, I would look at that 10.5 and, and I'd say, okay, so in order for this to hit, Notre Dame has to only lose one regular season game. And under Marcus Freeman, they've had two games a year at least where they just don't show up at all. Now, the circumstances were a lot different last year, like not showing up for a game against Louisville or Clemson and getting beaten by those teams who are both pretty good teams is one thing. It's obviously much different than in 2022 when they lost to Marshall and Stanford. But still, even though Notre Dame improved and I felt like Marcus Freeman didn't lose any of the absolutely you have to win games like he did in his first season as head coach, Notre Dame has got to, uh, they got to figure that out next season. They cannot just have these games where in the first half you're like, oh my God, like what? Were you guys all out last night? Like what is going on? Because that's kind of what it felt like in the Louisville and the Clemson game. So I still think the expectation is 11 games. They definitely have the talent on both sides of the ball to be really, really, really good this season. Personally, I think they have a chance to go undefeated win a game in the college football playoff. I don't think this is a national championship caliber roster, but if they don't, if they hit the under by more than a game, like if they go 9-3 and three this season, that seat is going to start getting hot for Marcus Freeman. And I don't want that. I don't expect it, but that's the reality because Notre Dame is too good this year to underachieve like that again. And uh, I feel pretty confident, though, that Notre Dame is going to end up hitting that over. So if you want to make some money, do that now. All right, next question. At Murray T., if you could add one player from the 2023 team not named Joe Alt to this year's roster, who would it be and why? This is a good question because the answer would have obviously been Joe Alt, if not for that clarification. So the two names that jumped out to me immediately were Cam Hart and J.D. Bertrand. Not necessarily the best players on last year's team, but very valuable veterans on that roster. Obviously, Audra Kesame was a great back. I think he's going to end up having a really good NFL career, but like, I'm really excited to see what Jadarian Price and Jeremiah Love are going to do as sort of a two-man tandem this season. They definitely bring a different dynamic than what Audric Essen brought. And that's not to take anything away from Audric. He was amazing. But I don't think that the gap in terms of talent and ability between Estime and then these two guys heading into next season is as significant as the gap for like J.D. Bertrand last year and Drake Bowen this year. And to be clear, I think Drake Bowen is going to be an excellent linebacker at Notre Dame. But next year, he's only going to be in his second year of college football playing the Mike linebacker position at Notre Dame where you're calling out the defenses and all that stuff. That's hard. And he does not have a lot of game experience. So he's going to definitely take some lumps this year. It happens. It happens to all the great players when you're really getting your first reps for the first time on Saturday. So, you know, if you have J.D. Bertrand, you're probably not getting any of that. And it's nice to have that anchor in the middle of what should be a really, really terrific defense. And then Cam Hart, he was just unbelievable last season. Like, teams just would not throw to him because he was locking down dudes left and right. I think, you know, if he can stay healthy, he's going to end up having a really good NFL career. But I don't think I'm going to take either Cam Hart or J.D. Bertrand and I think I got to take Blake Fisher. And I've been pretty critical about 
Blake Fisher season last year on this podcast. I also feel like I was a little bit critical about his dis- uh, about his decision to leave Notre Dame uh, to go to the NFL when he had the option to come back because I just felt like the tape that he put out last year just it just didn't live up to expectations, and I I don't think it's that great, but he has that ability. Like, you know he has the size, and um, I just feel like if he had another year in college to really just kind of be the man and be the dominant figure. Like, I think the this is going to be – this is going to sound weird, but having Joe Alt and his rise happen at the same time that Blake Fisher was in college, I think – wasn't the best thing for Blake Fisher. And it's weird because when Blake Fisher first got on campus, he was like the surefire freshman tackle. I mean, he started at left tackle in his first game ever as a true freshman, which is an insane accomplishment. Like the sky was the limit for Blake Fisher. He gets hurt. He misses the rest of the regular season. Then he comes in in that Fiesta Bowl game and puts on like a heroic performance against Oklahoma State, playing every snap. Um, And I think Notre Dame had like 70 offensive snaps in that game because it was so back and forth. And you're thinking, wow, like, this guy is going to be great. Plus, we've got Joe Walt coming in, and he's really developing too. Like, he's surprising us all. This is going to be the best tackle tandem ever. And it just really didn't turn out that way last year. And I think that, um, you know, maybe if Joe Walt wasn't there, Blake Fisher would have been more inclined to say, well, I don't know. I'm just kind of speculating here at this point. But I just feel like when you look at Notre Dame's situation at tackle, uh, it's pretty uncertain right now. You've got Charles Jagasaw, who I think has a really bright future as well. But he's going to be a redshirt freshman. Tosh Baker's a fifth-year senior who – has sat behind guys for his entire career and now it's really gonna get he's really gonna get his shot but it's also like really happy for Tosh Baker glad he stuck around I feel like he's got a role on the team this year but like there's also a reason why guys are playing over him for his entire career so um, I think it'd be nice to have Blake Fisher a little bit more consistency and a little bit more of a safe bet at tackle and it would probably quiet some concerns and that's sort of the frustrating thing is like I'm gonna take Blake Fisher on this and I think he should have come back it's not like Cam Hart or J.D. Bertrand, who uh, had been around for a long time. I actually think that both of them could have come back, but like it was time for them to go. So, yeah, I'm going to take Blake Fisher on this. Uh, I think it would be a big boost to a big question mark um, on this Notre Dame team, and uh, I think Notre Dame would be in a better place next year if they had Blake Fisher, but unfortunately that is not the case. Okay, got a couple more questions left, including the loudest I've ever heard at Notre Dame Stadium. That's coming right up. Today's episode is brought to you by Game Time. Game Time is the fast and easy way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With great deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for all of the fun you're going to have. I recently used Game Time to go to a concert. Wasn't even in the plans initially, but then I looked at Game Time. I looked at the prices, and I was like, you know what? I'm in. It's the fastest growing ticketing app in the country for a reason. You get images of your seat before you buy, so you know exactly what to expect once you arrive. Plus, you can buy tickets in a matter of seconds, just two taps in your set, and the tickets are sent directly to your phone so you never have to dig through your email. Take the guesswork out of buying tickets with Game Time. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKED ON for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, create an account, and re- redeem code L O C K E D O N for $20 off. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. Okay, we got a couple more questions left here, and usually I like to reserve the really fun questions for the end, and it's Friday, you know, I like to get a loose on the on the podcast on Friday. This next question, though, should have been fun, but it actually, it, it's really not, okay, because at jcollin underscore OG asks, what is the loudest you've ever heard Notre Dame Stadium? And it's easy for me. It was on the final drive of Notre Dame, Ohio State in 2023. It was so loud during that whole series. I mean, it it reached like a, a fever pitch when Notre Dame stuffed them on fourth and one, and Ryan Day ran that weak-ass end around that Notre Dame stopped, and it felt like Notre Dame just had that game won, and uh, the stadium just, it was rocking. I think there was like a fight that almost happened between like a Notre Dame fan and some Ohio State guys behind us because I think like the Ohio State people were accepting defeat and they were pissed off and they were fighting and the Notre Dame fan base was going insane. It was just really, really crazy. And then Ohio State gets the ball back and um, it was just so, so loud. So the fact that they're able to score, I mean, like the fact that Kyle McCord led that drive to it, like I'm just never going to get over the loss. I just It's just never going to happen. I've accepted it. I can't say I've moved on because I haven't, but it is what it is. So that's the loudest I've ever heard it. Um, I know that it was really loud during the Bush Bush game. I was not there. 2012 Stanford heard it was extremely loud for that. I was not there either. But I can say it was really loud during that Notre Dame Mission game in 2018 during the season opener. They actually played this video 
on uh, the big screen, and it was a clip from, I think it was 88, when the referee actually threw a flag on the Notre Dame crowd for being too loud. So they played that, and then they encouraged the fans to get louder than that, and it was really, really loud. I was really impressed by the Notre Dame fan base uh, in that game. That was a really, really fun game. Ben Koyak's game-winning touchdown in 2015, or 2014 was extremely loud. But the problem is the weather was so bad in that game. Like, it was rainy, and I think the weather, the temp was probably like 35 degrees. So a lot of people had left. So I think if it was a, a packed house, the roar would have been a little bit louder. But that was a crazy game winner. It's actually, like, kind of slept on. I feel like people forget about that one just because of the way that the 2014 season ended. But... That was a, a really great moment at the time. Um, if it's not Notre Dame, Ohio State, I would say Jeff Samarja's touchdown to beat UCLA in 2006 is up there as well. Um, funny story about that. I'm going to name drop here just for a second. I actually talked to Brady Quinn about that um, at our little Fox Sports station at the, I think it was Pac-12 Media Day. And we just had a break. It was after lunch, and I was I was talking to him for a little bit, and I told him that I was at that game. And he like apologized to me and I was like, what are you talking about? That's one of the greatest moments of my childhood. And he's like, that game sucked. And he just sort of went on and on about how awful that game was. The, he just didn't like anything about it. The offense, he said the game plan, nothing was working for him in that game. And then for them to finally come back and win there at the end was awesome. But then I went back and I watched the highlights and I was like, you know what? He is right. That game was terrible. Like it was awful. Thank God Notre Dame ended up winning that, and uh, you know kept the BCS hopes alive. And then Notre Dame ended up getting housed by USC at the end of the regular season. So it didn't really matter all that much. But still, that was a, a iconic moment. Something I'll never forget. I was ten years old. I think I. I mean, I'd definitely given up on the game. But um, yeah, it was an awesome game. Super loud. At the moment that Samarja cut back. It got so loud, and everyone stood up in front of me. I was, I was like 10 years old. I couldn't see. I think my dad had to like lift me up just to see Samarja going in the end zone. But as soon as he cut back, and it was clear that he was going to score because there's nothing but green grass ahead of him, that roar, like I'm never going to forget that. That was just in a, an incredible moment and something I'm never going to forget. Okay, last question. This one's pretty funny. This one's actually from a couple weeks ago. I just haven't really had the chance to get to it. At Huntley Ballestero. I hope I pronounced that right, brother. Um, I know Notre Dame is a small school. Did you have class with a lot of student athletes? As a matter of fact, I did because I was in the quote unquote athlete major, also known as film, television, and theater at Notre Dame. Now, it has the reputation of being the athlete major because a lot of people take it and it has the reputation, or a lot of student athletes take it, I should say. It has the reputation for being one of, if not the easiest major on Notre Dame's campus. I would push back on it being the easiest, but yeah, I mean, there were a lot of athletes in the class, and I know that if there's a lot of athletes, people just automatically assume that they're easy. There were definitely some classes in FTT that were pretty easy. Now, shout out to everyone in FTT, um, great professors, great department, great people. I, I loved being in that major, and obviously, you know, I, I took the television part somewhat seriously, and uh, I actually took a couple film classes and a couple, I guess, theater adjacent classes as well, because I took an acting class and a directing class, but really enjoyed my time, and most of the student athletes I had classes with were awesome, like, they were pretty normal students, and um, they really never came up all that often that they were athletes. Now, obviously, you know, basketball players sometimes wouldn't be around during the winter if they were on the road playing a game or something like that. But the the only time where I was in a class with an athlete where I was like, how are we in the same room, was my sophomore year. So this was 2015. I was in the same class as Jalen Smith. And this was pre-injury Jalen Smith when he was just the man. <laughs> like, he was one of the best players on the football team. The 2015 team was a really, really good football team. But he was so jacked and just so much bigger than everyone else around him. Had like an ounce of body fat. It was just like, dude, what are you doing in this classroom? Like you're going to be a top five pick one day and you're going to have all the money in the world. You're going to have a great NFL career. Like there was just simply no common ground between me and Jalen Smith other than the fact that we were in the same FTT class. And that's sort of, you know, the, the tragedy of it all with Jalen Smith. Now, he still had a great career for himself in the NFL. It got a second contract, made a bunch of money. So it still worked out for him, but it's just 
it is still depressing just thinking about what would have happened if he never suffered that injury because I think he was a surefire top three, you know, at worst top five pick in that NFL draft. He falls out of the first round because of the injury, and um, he was able to recover and, and still make a really good career for himself. But it's it's one of those things where, like, man, just imagine what he would have been if not for that because I think, you know, I think he had the potential to be, like, a Hall of Famer. And he also – while we're on the topic of Jalen Smith, could not have been nicer, was a great dude, uh, very respectful to the professor and every, And I think even the professor was like, dude, what are you doing here? Like, I appreciate you coming to class, but uh, you're going to be making more than anyone in this room here in a couple of short years. And even despite the injury, that was still pretty true. So um, yeah, had a lot of classes with athletes, really enjoyed it. And uh, I hope that if there's any FTT people listening, just know that uh, it's a great major. Nothing to be ashamed about being FTT. It worked out for me. Uh, I actually ended up having a career, in, and it's more in the digital space, but I do work on one TV show, so it counts. But that's going to do it for me today. That's a wrap for this week of Lockdown Irish. Thanks again for making this your first listen of the day. On your way out, please don't forget to subscribe to the show on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. If you have not already, and give the show a follow on social media. Have a great weekend, everybody. I will see you next Tuesday.